Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44, and we'll begin reading exactly where we left off last Wednesday evening uh, at, at, at verse 24, Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 24, Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 24, and we'll read down into chapter 45 all the way to verse 13. Okay, Isaiah chapter 44 and the 24th verse. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish that confirmeth the word of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed places thereof, that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up the rivers, that saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid." <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation and let the righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou, or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask of me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and he shall let go my captives, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Shall we pray? Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for the opportunity to open the word of life to the book of Isaiah and again to focus on this marvelous prophecy. And Father, we pray tonight that you would open up our eyes that we might behold wondrous things from thy law. Lord, that our hearts might be stirred, that our souls might be fed, and that our spirits might be encouraged in your truth. Father, we just ask tonight as we look into this passage that you'd help me to convey its truths with clarity and simplicity and help each one here to give the best of their attention to it uh, and indeed, Lord, to uh, learn thereby. And we pray, Father, that above all, we would be conformed to the image of thy Son and that he would be glorified by everything that is said this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, shortly before the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair, famously said, A day like today is not a day for sound bites, really, but I feel the hand of history upon our shoulders. 
I really do. I always think of that and I smile when he says it's not a day for sound bites and then he follows it with a sound bite. But nevertheless, whilst Tony Blair and I probably wouldn't have seen eye to eye on many things, uh, I have to say he was right in this regard. The hand of history was upon his shoulder. And it always is. Nations and kingdoms and empires are often moved by the hand of God in the interests of his own people. And that is the lesson that is set before us in this chapter at hand this evening. Whether it is Assyria or Babylon or Persia, the hand of God is in control. Whether it is Britain or America or China, God is in control. And that's the thrust of this reading tonight. Who's in charge of human history? Will not the puny men who, full of their own importance, sit at highly polished conference tables discussing the direction of their nations? But God on high. Tonight, our Prime Minister has flown off to Brussels and he's sitting down for a high powered meeting all about Brexit. And I'm sure everybody there has a real sense of their own importance and what they're doing. But the reality is that God is in control of that meeting and he is in control of the destiny of this nation. He and he alone. He alone holds the nations and their destinies in his hands. Now, from chapter 44 and verse 24 onward, where we began to read, uh, we uh, see, uh, we see the, the Lord outworking his plan and program with respect to the nation of Babylon and to the empire of Persia. Uh, last week, we saw the absurdity of idolatry in the earlier part of this chapter, and the challenge of God to the men who worship idols and the impotent gods that they create is let them tell the future. In uh, chapter 44 there, in verse 7, we read, Who as I shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. He says, here's my challenge. If these gods are gods at all, well, they will know about tomorrow. They'll know what's lying ahead. Let them tell. Let them show what is going to come uh, to pass. Could the idols and uh, could those idols tell their devotees what t tomorrow held? Of, of course not. These lumps of wood were fit only for burning in the fire to heat a home or burning in an oven to cook a meal. And yet with all, whilst they were reduced to ashes, these men were willing to bow before these lumps of wood and ascribe deity unto them. The metal objects they used had been, had been shaped in the blacksmith's shop and was hammered out, were hammered out upon his anvil. So from verse 24 onward, we have a passage of Scripture that both challenges the, uh, the idolatry of the early part of this chapter as well as really uh, exacerbates the skeptic and the liberal that defies their notion that the Bible is not the inspired Word of God. For here we have a word of prophecy concerning a world leader who at this point is 175 years away in terms of the future. And God names him and he tells them exactly what this leader is going to do when he comes. You see, prophecy is really just history in advance. That's what it is. We said it before, haven't we? Prophecy is history in advance. And here is God giving the advance history of the, uh, of the nation of Babylon and in relation to the nation of Judah. Uh, you know, when you think about even what's happening tonight in Europe, you know, the European Union is prophesied in Scripture. And uh, the Bible tells us how that there would be uh, parts of it that would hold solid and other parts that would be brittle and break away. And you see that even transpiring in the events of Brexit. Now, Britain is breaking away from the European Union, uh, and that was predicted. So whilst these politicians are sitting around the table thinking that they're making history, they're really just fulfilling history. They're simply fulfilling prophecy. And so it is here. 
Now, this text is readily outlined for us by the recurrence of the phrase, thus saith the Lord. You find that phrase in verse 24. You find it again in verse 1, thus saith the Lord. And again in verse 11, thus saith the Lord. In fact, that's a phrase that appears around 1900 times in the Old Testament. And it is a statement of inspiration. It's telling you that it's not the writers who are speaking, but that God himself is speaking. And so Isaiah is simply recording the very words of the living God. And so in this text, the uh, verse 24, the thus saith the Lord there, and then across in chapter 45 and verse 11, the thus saith the Lord there, those two thus saith the Lord's act as, as bookends to, uh, to the, part, the verses that lie in between them. Uh, and in both of those sections, the early section and the latter section, God affirms and reaffirms who he is and what he does. And then in between, he tells us what he will do with respect to Babylon and Persia and why he is going to do it. Well, let's look at verses 24 to 28 of chapter 44 and think about what God does. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the words of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah you shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof, that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers, that saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So here we have what God does. And to get a grasp uh, of, uh, of these few verses, our focus needs to be upon the participles that you find in that text. Now, if you say, what's a participle? Uh, grammatically speaking, a participle is a verb that is used in a descriptive way. It's helping us to see what the subject of the sentence is doing or has done. Uh, when he's going to do it, either past, present, or future. So here we'll see what God has done in the past, what he is doing in the present, and what he will do in the future. Well, look at God's actions in verse 24. These are in the past. He begins, thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. Now, as before, he reminds his people that he is the Lord, that he is sovereign, and that he is their redeemer. He is savior. He also reminds them that he is their creator. Thus saith the Lord, thy redeemer, and he that formed thee from the wound. And then you have the first three participles recorded for us. Maketh, stretcheth, and spreadeth. Those are the three words you need to focus on in that verse. He makes something, he stretches something, he spreadeth something. Now, these words emphasize the omnipotence of God. The fact that he made everything is in stark contrast to idols which are the products of men. Men make idols, but God made everything. Nothing makes God. I am the Lord, he says, that maketh all things. You know, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostle John in his gospel said, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And Paul adds to those words in Colossians 1.16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Then he adds that stretcheth forth the heavens 
alone. Now, this is a statement borne out by science. The heavens were stretched by God in the beginning, and they continue to be stretched by God's Word. They're stretching still. The universe is ever expanding. It has the fingerprint of the eternal upon it. That's why you can never get to the end of it. And it's a great frustration to scientists, isn't it? Because no matter how powerful your telescope is, you're never going to get to a sign that says the end. <laughs> never. And so here scientists are faced with this impossible task of trying in their minds to find life elsewhere in the universe. Well, you know, if they would listen to the Word of God, they'd realize this is it. This is all the life there is in the universe on this planet. You know, yesterday I read in the Daily Mail online uh, an Israeli scientist who says that aliens have already made contact with Earth. Uh, did you read that in the paper yesterday, in the online news yesterday? That aliens have already made contact with the Earth, and uh, the, they've had a conversation with President Trump, and uh, they've had, a, they've had a, a conversation with American scientists, but they don't want us to know because we'd be alarmed by their presence. Which, if you would think, if, if that was the case, this scientist is really in breach of a confidence there. But uh, in today, in the, same, in the same news outlet, there's another article that says scientists have come to the conclusion that there is no planet in the entire solar system that they can see, or in, in as far as they can see, that will be able to have the conditions that are perfect for life such as earth has. So you have these two contradictory, you know, statements in the same news outlet. One day we'd be in conversation with aliens. The next day there's no possibility for aliens. Well, you know, the Bible is clear here that God has put his own stamp upon the universe, and the universe is eternal, and his focus is upon earth, and when it comes to earth, his focus is particularly upon that little strip of land that we call Israel. Okay, so uh, he alone has made the world, the, the, the heavens. Notice that word alone. You know, idols need a creator, but God doesn't need anyone, and he doesn't need anything. He created everything. And finally, there it says, he's the one that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. And you see that word spreadeth, it means to stamp or to beat out. And this is using the language of the blacksmiths. He's going back into the blacksmith's shop, and he's saying, here's this fellow, and he's beating out an idol upon his anvil. Well, I want him to know that I have beaten out the entire earth by the word of my mouth. I have hammered it into shape. I'm the one who created it uh, by my power. And, I, and again, notice the emphasis here. This is his work particularly. He says, I did it by myself. I did it by myself. You know, I think I shared with you before that I was in conversation with a Jehovah's Witness one day who was trying to convince me that God first created Jesus as a mighty God, as a lesser God, which, exact, which Isaiah actually denies at any possibility of, uh, and then Jesus created everything else. And, uh, you know, I took him to this verse, and I showed him that the Lord had spread abroad the earth, and he said, he did it by myself. And I said, how could he say that if Jesus had done it? And uh, he said, uh, I, I said to him, look, I said, we were sitting in my, in my dining room at the time. I said, you see this dining room? I says, my son painted these walls. Now, if I were to say to you, I did this by myself, that would be deceptive. It would be dishonest. And he says, yes, but you told him how to paint it, and you told him what colors to choose. So therefore, you did do it. <laughs> and I said, but I, even if I did, I didn't do it by myself. That's the point. God did it by himself. Jesus did it by himself, because he is God, the Son, and the Son of God. So what he's saying here is, no one helped me. No one created me. The, this answers the age-old question, where did God come from? You know, the skeptic says, where did God come from? Well, God says, I didn't come from anywhere. I've always been God, and no one or nothing contributed to my existence, but everything comes from me. 
So God, as before in this book, has set out his credentials as our creator, and he's laying claim to the devotion of his people on that basis alone. Then we see what he was doing in the present in verses 25 and 26. Notice again the participles. Now you're looking for uh, different words here. You're looking for the words frustrateth, turneth, sorry, frustrateth, maketh, and turneth. So we find him frustrating, humbling, and confounding his enemies. He's the one, notice, who frustrateth the tokens of the liars. His truth shatters their lies. It always does. The best way to counter error is with truth. That's the, that's the, the thing that will put earth, that will cast light upon darkness, is the truth. And so uh, he's the one who does that by his word, and he still does. He's the one who makes diviners mad. In other words, he makes them look foolish. And what can be more foolish than a man who makes a god from the same wood that he uses to heat his home and to cook his meals and then bows down to him? And God in this, in this very chapter has exposed the folly of that. He's, he's remarked on that with great sarcasm and said, look at the nonsense this is. He takes that piece of wood, the same piece of wood that, he, that he, uh, he's cooking his food upon and uh, heating his home with, and he goes and he worships the stump of a tree. Do you remember that? Just a branch of a tree. And then he's the one who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolish. And he's still doing that. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved... It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I would say if I were to have a motto for my ministry, that would probably be it. Verse 21, that it, saved, that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know, uh, preaching is a foolish pastime when you think about it. But I'm absolutely convinced in the primacy of preaching and the importance of preaching and that if we are faithful in declaring God's word he is faithful in doing his part in honoring the word that is preached to the saving of souls and finally in this section in verse 26 he tells us what he will do in the future notice he says he will confirm his word he will perform the counsel of his servants and he will raise up the cities of Judah from the decayed places those are the participles you want to look at confirmed perform and raise up. He will confirm his word. You know, those who balked at the prophetic utterances of Isaiah, who thought that it was a nonsense that God would use a pagan king to bless Israel in this way. Well, 175 years later, guess what? They found that it wasn't a nonsense. God confirmed his word. God always does what he says he's going to do, which brings us to the next participle, performeth. They confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers. Jeremiah said this, Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Jeremiah 1 and verse 12. And then he will raise up the decayed places. That is, he will restore Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the cities of Israel, devastated by Babylonian invasion. They would be rebuilt and they would be re-inhabited. That's what God was going to do. Now, how was God going to do this? Well, here's the exciting part now as we follow along. In verse 27, he points them back to the Exodus. And he says, you remember how I delivered you from Egypt. He talks about the dry, drying up of the rivers. Uh, thy saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. Now remember, we said the last time we were in this book, I think, or at least we said it in the last few weeks, that the Exodus is really a pivotal moment in Jewish history. 
that the Jews are constantly called to look back to that moment, whether it's in their Passover meal or even being reminded by Scripture of the Red Sea crossing. They're always reminded that God saved them, that he redeemed them out of the land of Egypt and brought them out from under the, uh, the oppression of Pharaoh. Now, that's what he did in the past. So he reminds them in the past he delivered the nation when all seemed hopeless. After 400 years of, uh, of slavery, when it looked like they were never going to be free, what did God do? He raised up a Savior in Moses. Now he's going to do the same thing in the relatively near future. And notice he's going to do it by the hand of this particular individual that saith of Cyrus, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So here the Lord names Cyrus, Cyrus the great of Persia, whom he calls, or surnames, my shepherd. Uh, you know, he calls himself Cyrus the great, but God calls him Cyrus my shepherd. And that's a little bit different, isn't it? God doesn't take quite such a high view of Cyrus as Cyrus takes of himself. But nevertheless, God recognizes, or not recognizes, but God uh, foreplans that Cyrus would be the one who would deliver uh, the Israelites back to Judah from the land of Persia, or Babylon as it once was. Now, you've got to remember, all of this is written, as Isaiah is recording this, it's 75 to 85 years before Babylon even invades Judah. So, you know, if you're looking at that from their point of view, first of all, you've got this surprising news that there's going to be a rising Babylonian empire. That's like, you know, me telling you, listen, 75 years from now, you know, the French are going to invade Britain and we're all going to be taken captives. You'd be like, well, how could you even know that? There's no sign of that. You know, there's no French empire today. You know, why would the French do that? Uh, there's no indication that that's likely to happen. Well, that's where the people of Judah were. 75, 85 years down the line, God says, this is what's going to happen. This king's going to come. Actually, he names him also, by the way. He tells them his name, Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to come, and he's going to carry you off captive, and you'll go for 70 years into a strange land. So there was no Babylonian empire to speak of at this point. The Assyrians were the dominant force in the world at this time. And as for the Persians... The Persians were nowhere men. <laughs> so the idea that a Persian king was going to come at the end of all of this and deliver the, the people of Judah back to the land just seemed as offbeat as you could imagine you know, in, in your own mind. So having told us who he's going to use, he now tells us how he's going to do it. Notice what God will do in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee, and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. Now, previously, we just read, God calls Cyrus my shepherd. And, and as such, he's the one who's going to be effectively shepherding the people back into the land of Israel, back into the city of Jerusalem, and back to the place where they are ready to erect their temple. But now, shockingly, notice what he calls him in verse 1 of chapter 45, he calls him his anointed. Now, I say shockingly, because this is a title that is never given to a Gentile king. It is a title that belongs to Israel's prophets, Israel's priests, Israel's kings. Remember, David said, you were not to touch the Lord's anointed, referring to King Saul. The kings of Israel and Judah were the Lord's anointed, but to refer to a pagan king as the Lord's anointed was pretty shocking to the ears, even more shocking when by this stage in history, they're thinking of the Messiah as the Lord's anointed. So this really must have jarred in their ears. How could a Gentile king 
in the future, who knows how long in the future, possibly be the Lord's anointed. But by calling Cyrus the Lord's anointed, his anointed, the Lord was teaching him, teaching them that he was the Lord of all the earth. Not just the Lord of the Jew, not just the Lord of Judah or of Israel, but the Lord over every nation. Now the key thing here in those verses we just read in verses 1 to 3 is that Cyrus's conquest and victory over the ancient world in general and Babylon in particular would be God's doing. Notice, you should get up, if you've got a pen, mark the I wills there. He says, I will loose the loins of kings in verse 1. I will go before thee, verse 2. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, verse 2. Verse 3, I will give thee the treasures of darkness. Who's doing is this? Is this Cyrus the Great? Or is this Cyrus the shepherd, the anointed of the Lord? You see the, you see the perspective here? It's the Lord's doing. This is the Lord going to be aiding Cyrus in this, uh, in this advancement. So here we see that the Lord calls himself the one whose right hand I have holding. He, he, he describes himself as holding the right hand of Cyrus. And we said before, the right hand is the hand of power, the hand of blessing. Uh, and it was to be held by God. And by his will, he would do a number of things. If you look down that passage, number one, he'll subdue the nations. He'll conquer the known world. Number two, he will loose the loins of kings. Now, if uh, you read some commentaries, they'll be very polite about this. And they'll say that uh, that means that he's going to strip the kings of their powers, and in particular the king of Babylon, of his power. That he, they have this belt around their middle in which they have their sword, and that loosing the loins of kings is, essentially, is effectively surrendering your weaponry and surrendering your kingdom. You're taking your belt off. That's if you want to be polite about it. Okay? If you're not so polite about it, it could literally mean that they will soil themselves when they hear Cyrus is coming. And I think that's probably what God is saying. He's saying, I'm going to put such fear into the hearts of men that when kings hear the Persian army is on their way, they're going to fear for their lives. Remember the Babylonians, they, they get on their ships. Remember they get on the merchant vessels, the Phoenician ships, and they, they headed off for refuge. They were running in fear from Cyrus. And, and I think that's what God is saying here. He would put the fear of God into the Babylonian empire. And then notice, he would open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Now Herodotus, the famous Greek uh, historian who lived during the Persian empire, said this of Babylon, there are a hundred gates in the circuit of the wall, all of bronze with bronze uprights, and lintels. The most famous of those gates is the Ishtar Gate, which you can see in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. And, uh, and these are magnificent and very imposing structures that would have defended the city of Babylon. But God says, listen, you, I'm going to make it that those gates are opened. I'm going to make the crooked, the crooked path straight. I'm giving Cyrus a free run at this. They're going to open these gates, and they're not going to be shut. In other words, the city of Babylon was going to be left completely defenseless and that it would come tumbling down at the hand of this emperor. And then we read in verse, uh, in verse 3 that God would give to Cyrus the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. That is, he would open up to him the storehouses and the treasure houses of those nations upon whom Cyrus would, uh, uh, would, would descend. Now, God, someone commented, and I think this is truth, God always pays his servants. <laughs> By opening up the treasure houses, he's rewarding Cyrus in this life for his blessing to Israel that is to come. And God always rewards his servants. You know, uh, you know in that respect, you know, I think that whilst the world is highly critical and, and disparaging of President Trump, you can't take away from the man that he blessed Israel. And if you think that God is not going to take that into account in his dealings with President Trump, well, you're mistaken. No matter what you think of him, even if you think that President Trump is the biggest idiot that ever walked into the White House, if that's what you think, well, that's your opinion and you're entitled to it. But understand, even if he is the biggest idiot that ever walked into the White House, he's going to be a very blessed idiot because God has promised to pay him for his service. So in some way, there's going to be a payback to that president 
for the things he did in the favor of Israel. Now, notice what the Lord says he's going to do, why he's going to do this. He says that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Now, Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that Cyrus actually read this prophecy beforehand, that he had heard that he was mentioned in a Jewish book, and that he took the time to discover it and to read it for himself and found his name recorded already in the book, telling him what he would do. Now, that's got to be an amazing thing, isn't it? Can you imagine opening the Bible? Can you imagine if Boris Johnson opened the Bible to Zechariah and said, there's going to be a guy called Boris Johnson and this is what he's going to do? I mean, that'd be pretty, pretty amazing, wouldn't it, from, from his point of view? And uh, look in Ezra chapter 1 for a moment, the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 1, and note, notice how Ezra introduces this book of the Bible. Verse 1, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Now, notice what Cyrus says. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Now, I don't think you could read verses 2 and 3 and not get the idea that Cyrus had some idea as to what he was doing and why he was doing it. He was saying the God of Israel prophesied this. He predicted this moment, and I'm going to do what he said I should do. <laughs> and I love that. And that's borne out by history. You know, one of the most important artifacts in the British Museum is the Cyrus Cylinder, which records these events and how that the king, uh, as part of his policy, returned captives back to their homelands, including the land of Israel. So it's a remarkable prophecy. And we could say, if Cyrus was standing here that, and, and he had some sound bite to make, he might say, well, the hand of history was upon my shoulder. <laughs> now we see not only what God would do, but more significantly, why God was going to do it. Look in verse 4. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me, though you're a pagan. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So verse 5 tells us that God wasn't doing these things just to honor Cyrus. He wasn't doing it for the sake of the Persian king or the Persian kingdom at all, but it was all about his people. It was all about Israel, for Jacob, my servant's sake. Understand something. God always directs history in the interests of his own people. He always directs history in the interests of his own people. When the Babylonians came and took Jerusalem, guess what? That was in the interests of his own people. You say, how was that so? You know, here they were, they were, you know, slaughtered, they were, they were tortured, they were carried off to a foreign land. How could that be in their interest? Because it cured them of idolatry. That's how it was in their interest. And so we mustn't miss this fact. You know, God is going to use Cyrus to bring them back to the land. Again, he's, he's raising this king to do down the Babylonians to free up the Israelite and to allow them to return to Judah. He's doing it in the interests of his people. 
And so you mustn't miss the importance of Israel on the stage of human history. You know, God is still at work in that nation and for that nation. And although Israel, when you think about it, has largely dropped out of the news in the past year owing to the coronavirus and the pandemic globally, God is still working on behalf of that nation. And you know, the thing that strikes me when I, when I think about that is that in the West, and I think this is probably true the world over, but certainly true in the West, we tend to be preoccupied with our own affairs, and we never think to look over the garden fence, as it were, to see what's going on in Israel. Actually, some very interesting things happened in the Middle East this year that didn't come up on the, uh, on the news radar. And, uh, you know, if you were to go back and look there and, and read some of the events, you know, some peace treaties were signed that were really important, peace treaties, that almost would suggest to you that there was a setup coming for the ultimate peace treaty with the Antichrist. And other events took place in the land of Israel, which largely went unnoticed because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And, you know, a lot of times Christians get very excited about, you know, the pandemic. And, and you know, we've talked about this before. They're very concerned that all of this is part and parcel of some great conspiracy by, the, by anti-Christian forces and what have you. Uh, you know, time will tell whether that is or whether it isn't. But, but here's the thing. When we, when we speak that way, our focus is on ourselves. God's focus is always on the Middle East, on the nation of Israel. That's not to say he doesn't deal with other nations, because obviously he does, but he does deal with them in relation to Israel. That's the thing I'm driving at. So we see the first reason that God will raise Cyrus for the sake of his people, for Judah. Then in verse 5, we're told he will do it to prove he has sovereign power to accomplish things for people that don't even know him to show that he is not just the God of Israel alone, but the Lord over all nations, even nations who do not know him nor honor his name. So when you think about that, who's the Lord of Thailand? God is. Who's the Lord of Yemen? The Lord is. You know, who's the Lord over India, a land with 365 million gods? The Lord is. He is Lord of India. And he's coming back to claim India for himself someday, along with every other nation on earth. You see, all of it belongs to him, and he's the one who directs their affairs. So the raising of Cyrus to overthrow Babylon is proof of this. Thirdly, he wants the whole world to know that he's in charge of everything. Look in verse 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun in the west is a, is a euphemism, it's, a, it's a, a, a phrase that is used to describe the whole earth, that there's none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. In other words, nothing in our world happens by chance. Nothing, whether it's a blessing or whether it's a curse, it's all directed by God. I form the light, he says, and create the I make peace and create evil. Now, he doesn't say, he's not saying he creates sin. God is not the author of sin. But, you know, when you think about evil in this sense, from a Jewish point of view, the invasion of the Babylonians was an evil. It was, uh, it was um, an adversity. And that's saying. He says, sometimes I make, the, I make the circumstances wonderful and blessed. Other times they're difficult and adverse. But I do it. I choose where, when, and how. That's what makes me God. And verse 8 then comes along, and it's a transitional verse. Drop down ye heavens from above, let the skies pour down righteousness, let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation, let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, hath created it. And here God's righteous purposes, of his righteousness, of his and pouring down upon the earth from heaven like a great rainfall. But before he moves into the final reaffirmation of his credentials as the God of Israel, he has something to say to those people who, on first hearing of this prophecy, shook their heads and said, This can't possibly be right. Isaiah is mistaken. I mean, he's all somewhere along the line. Look in verse 9. Woe to him that strives with his maker. Let the pots herds strive with the pots herds of the earth. Shall they say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou, or thy work he hath hands? Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou, or woman, what hast thou brought forth? Now, you've got to picture the 
your mind's eye, hearing these words from Isaiah's lips, and God is going to take you, first of all, into a strange land which doesn't even exist in essence at this point in time, but he's going to take you off to this strange land. You're going to stay there for 70 years. And after 70 years, he's going to raise up a Gentile king who's his anointed called Cyrus, and the aid you in getting back to the land again. And then hearing that message, just thought this was so Oh, a pagan is going to be our savior. How could it possibly be? It was a jumping revelation. To the Jewish heart, this was a complete impossibility. God would never do that. God would not be behind such a thing. And what did he say? Woe unto him that strives with his maker. He says, I don't make the decisions here. <laughs> you don't make the decisions. Let the pots herd strive with the pots of the earth. You can argue among yourselves, but you can't. Shall I say to him that fashioneth it, What thy or thy work he hath no hands? You know, here we are in the potteries. If anybody knows about clay, it's people in Stoke on Trent. And you know, well, the potter's in charge of his wheel. And if he's going to make a teapot, a teapot's what he's going to make. He threw in the teapot, say to him, I'd like to be a vase. Thank you very much. No saying this, you're a lump of clay, you'll do exactly what I intend uh, ten for you to do. I want you to be whatever I want you to be. And he said unto him that says to his father, What begettest thou to the woman? What hast thou brought forth? Imagine speaking like that. Saying to your mother, Well, you've never you've never you've never um, produced you've never produced any anybody. You children. <laughs> what are you talking about, you lunatic? You're one of my children. Thing to say. And God is saying that to the people. He's saying, you're contesting with me, but I'm the one who made you. I'm your father. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who created you. How can you possibly stand up and defy me and suggest for one moment that I have a better plan, that I've got it wrong? Somehow or other, you've got it right. Look, you've got to listen to me. Cyrus is coming and he's going to deliver you. And then in verse we see a reaction of who God is. And again, God comes back to this thing he's come over that's come that we've come upon again and reaffirming his his rights, getting his credentials, letting his people know that he is God and worthy of their devotion. You know, earlier he had chapter idols of men to tell the future. Now it says in verse eleven, I me of things to come. He said, I the idols but they can't give me an answer. So me of things to come. Pray and see if I know what tomorrow holds. Pray of me as to what the future is going to be. You see, he's letting people know that he is the Lord of prayer. And then in verse 12, he lets them know he's the Lord of creation again. I the earth and created man upon it. I my hands have stretched out the heavens and all things have I commanded. And finally, he lets He's the Lord of history. And what does say? It's history in advance. I raised him up in righteousness. Notice about it in the past tense. He says, <laughs> He doesn't him up at this point. He says, I've done it. I've signed the check. It's too late. I, you know, from my perspective, it's past tense. From my perspective, it's future tense. But I've raised him up in righteousness of Zarus. And I will all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let go my captives. No price, no reward. He's going to be blackmailed into it. He's not going to be paid off. He's going to do it just simply because God told him to do it. Not for price, no reward, saith the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of history. As we read these marvelous words, that I know with the hindsight of history, happened. Everything recorded here actually is. Cyrus did all the that Isaiah predicted 200 years before Cyrus came along. As we take comfort in the fact of God, the, the, the knowledge of God's purposes. You see, that's the thing that I, oh, I take comfort from that. No matter how the news is, God has his purposes. God has his reasons. 
And I'm not here to question God's movement among the nations or God's movement in human history. He had his purposes for Israel. He has his purposes for the nations as a whole, including the United Kingdom. And he has his purposes for our lives also as individuals. You see, he called us by name. Surely, as he knew long before Harris was laying upon his mother's knee and named, God knew him, named them in advance. God knew you and me, named us. In he saw us coming. You may have been a surprise baby to your parents, <laughs> but your surprise baby to God. You would arrive. He knew us the foundation of the earth was laid and he used us. Now get this, this time, moment of history and into this space, this place in time for his own purposes. The words of the book of Esther for such a time as this. You know, look over history and think, I wish I time I see a cowboy movie. <laughs> I, 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 I'm watching cowboys and I think I'd love to have been a cowboy. <laughs> I've told Hazel on my bucket list is we're going to go to Soda and look around territory and want to ride a horse and help a cow and all that stuff. But maybe even shoot. But, um, God didn't place me that space and time. Into the space and time. You may look back at your own favorite history and say, you know, I wish I'd been born in an area when they had those flock, frocks or in the Middle Ages, you know, and the court of Henry the whatever. You know, you may, have, you may say, I wish I'd been born when Jesus was here. I wish I could have been when Jesus was here. But God didn't design for you to be here when Jesus was here. He designed you to be here today. Thus, no, in this place, for such a time as this, he's fulfilling his own purposes. An accident, and here by accident, God is working through all to his own end. And it's a blessing in and disturbing time. When the world has so much upheaval in the past months, and it feels like our whole lives have been turned on their head. God is still in control and hell shall pray. Thought our Bibles were the 